and I couldn't breathe. I was literally drowning in soap. The man was freaking out because I'm just like gasping for air, gasping for air. Well, so Mark, let me let me ask you, since the audience may be wondering, and it's a really important question, did you die? <laughs> yes, I did. And now I'm back to haunt you for the rest of your life. Fuck! All right. <laughs> Welcome to The Everglow, a podcast with real advice you can actually use to live a better, happier life, especially if you're an empath. No burning sage, no crystals, no BS. Join me as I travel the world sharing the valuable lessons I learned. Hit subscribe on iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this to get new episode updates. You know how sometimes in life you meet somebody and you only know them for a short while, but you become the bestest of friends? Well, that's my friend Dally, and today you're going to meet him. Welcome everybody to the latest episode of Everglow. I have a huge treat for you today. I'm having my first guest ever slash co-host for today. His name is Dally from Dallas, and we met in uh, the most unique place of Almaty, Kazakhstan, uh, when I did a G Adventures trip back in, I guess when was it, Dali? Like 2016, right? Yeah, 2016. 2016. We went to uh, well, I went by myself to Central Asia, and I met Dali on that trip in Kazakhstan. So uh, here he is. Why don't you introduce yourself, Dali, and we can chat a little bit about how we met and go from there. And today we're going to talk about travel, but also about setting goals and achieving them. So we're going to use travel as our kind of uh, discussion point for setting and achieving goals. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Dali? Hey guys. Um, as a, as an AB3 refers to me as Dali, my, my real name is Mark. So either one is, is fine. I answer to both, which is fine. Um, as, as he mentioned, we met in Almaty at the Otrar Hotel. Uh, it didn't seem like at the time that there was any other guest in the hotel except for the people that were actually going to be on our Central Asia tour. Um, when I first saw AB3, it was uh, not in a group setting. It was just sort of as seeing somebody randomly leaving the hotel. And uh, I wasn't sure if he was on my tour or not. You're always sort of uh, on the lookout for potential uh people that are going to be traveling with you when you arrive at a hotel a little early. And uh, my first impression, if uh, it's okay to say that in front of everyone. Oh, bring it. I can't wait for this. Let's see. <laughs> is that I, I thought you were a little bit snooty, uh, uptight, awesome. maybe a little bit pretentious. I thought <laughs> yes. That, I thought that maybe you were of the – Maybe you were gay because I'm always walking around with my gaydar on because uh, I am gay and it just seems like I'm always looked on the lookout for someone else that's part of my family. Uh, I take that as a just sorry to interrupt you. I take that as a for our listeners out there. I take that as a gigantic compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, uh, I I wasn't surprised to find out though that that you are not, especially when we uh, went to a restaurant with the little river that was sort of below. Oh, I remember that. Like, yeah. And you were like saying, oh, look at that chick. And I'm like, okay, uh, a gay person doesn't use the word chick. We, <laughs> may, we may use the word cock, but not we don't use the word chick. So, Oh, really? oh wait a minute. Let's, re let's, let's put a pause here. So if you're referring to like a, a guy you think is cute or hot or whatever – you would refer to them as a cock? No, no, I wouldn't. But we don't like with sort of the farm animal <laughs> context. We wouldn't just go around saying, uh, "Look at that chick." We would say, "Look at that girl." Look at that lady. Um, and we would not refer to a guy as a cock, but we would use the term cock to describe other things. Oh, I see. Okay, I got you. Um, well, hey, that, I don't know what it was about that girl that was working at that place that day, but you know, so, like, you know, some people exude a beauty or attractive and attractiveness to certain people. 
there was just something really cute about that girl. I, I'm pretty sure I still have the photo. So probably when I, once this podcast is done, I'll post a photo of her because she took photos with us after the fact. I don't know. There's just something really like really cute about her. So, anyways, that's a I'm going off on a tangent. So, so Mark, Mark, you thought when you first saw me at the hotel, you thought I was gay. Uh, and I remember we didn't really, I didn't really like get to know you or notice you until we had our first group meeting. And then we ended up being, um, together in vans and I'm not referring to the bang, bra- the bang bus that you see here in the United States, <laughs> but there was a group of what, there was probably like 15 of us and they broke us up into a couple of vans to get around town and around changing countries as we went from Kazakhstan through to Uzbekistan. And Dali and I were in one of the same vans and, um, you know, that's where the chatting started, but there's a song that actually got us talking first, right? Because you're usually sitting at the front of the van and in typical me fashion, I was sitting at the back of the van. And then I don't think we were originally going to talk much because you, you had come there with, I don't, you didn't fly directly there. I think with our friend Susan, but you kind of had knew, knew a couple people on the tour and I didn't, uh, except for Matt. And so I thought, okay, well you already have your own click. So I'm probably not going to end up talking to this guy. But then what happened? Well, what happened is like we were in a shopping mall. For some reason, our tour guide had us walk through a shopping mall when we were going from one part of the main city center of Almaty to another. And I just started singing Faded by Alan Walker. And you were like, shocked you were just like that's my favorite song i can't believe that you're singing that out of the blue and i'm like oh yeah i love that song too so it sort of bonded us it sort of like um became the theme song of the trip Mm -hmm. there were a couple of other instances where uh out of nowhere that song was playing one time was when we uh flew from um from bishkek to uh to Shanby, and as soon as we landed, someone's ringtone on the plane went off playing that song. It was just, it was too much. It was like, okay, this is really telling us that this is the theme song of the trip. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so that's, a, you know, that's a big thing we talk about on this show is law of attraction. And, you know, some people just try to discard it away and call it selective attention. You know, when you're thinking about something, it's not that you're bringing it to you, but that you just happen to be noticing a certain thing more. But I actually believe there's more to it than that. I actually think when you think about things, they they manifest themselves more often in places you wouldn't think about. That song being a great example of that, because as popular and as many billions of uh, plays as that song has had on YouTube and around the world on other platforms... The reality is you don't really hear that song on in mainstream on mainstream radio in the United States. You just don't. I mean, if you turn on an FM radio station, you'll never hear Alan Walker because it's more of an EDM kind of song music. Maybe it's too commercial now to be called that. But I mean, I first heard it. That song had a special uh, meaning to me because I first heard it in uh, 20... Actually, it was that same year in 2016, actually. it was, But it was earlier when I'd gone to Peru. And I was going through a really tough time, uh, which seems to be the common thread of the show. But I had had this crazy tenant living at, at the bottom of my, you know, in my house. And he ended up being like a, a nut, one of these low lives. And I didn't screen him properly. And he wouldn't leave. And I was living in the same place. And it was just gnawing at me. Like I when I went to Peru... All I could think about is this guy going to burn my house down. I mean, I was living in fear, but I remember one day in Peru, I had taken a side trip to go whitewater rafting on the Yorubamba River, and I remember that the, one of the guides or the the whitewater rafting guys he started playing that faded song while we're t- you know going through the countryside to get to the Yorubamba River, and that song like there's something so amazing about it. Like it, the, you know, some songs you have to listen to a few times before they stick with you. There was something so unique about that song. It it really stuck with me and I had to Google it after. And I figured out what it was uh, when I got back to the United States. And so it was almost like a song that would appear when I would travel. And so it was interesting that it kept reoccurring throughout, throughout our trip. Right. Right. Well, it did. And there were some other things too. You talk about law of attraction I don't even know if you recall um, some of the things that happened. I remember we were 
eating outdoors one night and you said, Dally, you know that if you look up at the sky, you can uh, see a falling star. It does. It won't take but like 30 or seconds to a minute and you'll see a falling star. I'm like, oh, you're, you're full of it. There's, that's not going to happen. So we stared at the sky and sure enough, within a matter of seconds, we saw a falling star. <laughs> and you'd never seen one before, right? Well, I had seen them, but I'd never seen it with somebody else at the same moment when we're both looking for it. Right. So that's what was so, uh, you know, it was really a nice touch to our sort of blossoming friendship. And uh, it was sort of confirmation, too, that this is a friendship maybe worth pursuing. You look for little signs when you're meeting someone, whether it's, um, you know, platonic or something more just to make sure that you're on the right track. And uh, when nature tells you that everything's good, it, it's very reassuring. Um, and then there was the other thing with, um, you had mentioned another song about, I forget who, it was maybe Tiesto and you shimmer. And, yeah, shimmer. Uh, mm-hmm. The lights go out. What What is it? Every time you go, the lights go out. Well, our very last night, at the hotel in Uzbekistan in Tashkent, uh, we said goodbye and we were all downstairs hugging each other. And lo and behold, at the lights and the whole place didn't go out. I remember and that. And yeah. I had, had forgotten about the song. And you texted me like a little bit later when I got to my room and I was like, Oh my gosh, you're right. The lights did go out when we said goodbye. So it was all little confirmations of we were on the, right track. Uh, we were, we were sort of connected in a way. And one thing about travel is that when you do travel and you meet people abroad and whether you meet them in, in their home country or you meet them and they're from other countries or other places around the world and you have a connection, there's something about being with them 24 seven for several days in a row that sort of bonds you a lot quicker because you get to see them you know, maybe not looking their best, especially in some of the trips that we've done where you maybe stay in a homestay or you sleep in a yurt and you're overnight and you haven't showered and you sort of become more like family a lot quicker than you would just by meeting someone in your hometown and going to dinner with them once every two or three months. Even though their proximity allows you to see them more often, the sort of the tight quarters and the frequency all packed into a short amount of time gives you a special bond. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, I was just mentioning this in my last podcast and talking with my friend uh, Linda about this the other day. And it's true. When you travel, you end up being closer friends or getting to know people at a deeper level. And I would say almost a more spiritual level than you would with people, you know, back home. Like I've known people for 10 or 15 years that I would consider really good friends, but there's a depth to your relationship when you travel with somebody for even just a couple of weeks. And I had used my Vietnam trip to, uh, Cont- with Contiki. Uh, I've done a lot of trips, but the Vietnam one always stuck with me because of how tight we were or the trip I did with, uh, also Contiki, interestingly enough, where I did Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. I mean, the group, we all keep in touch. I've, some have visited me. Um, you know, Matt, we see all the time. It's just amazing, this level of camaraderie. And you kind of understand, uh, maybe it's a bad example, but I'll throw it out there. You kind of understand these soldiers that go to war, where they consider everybody their their brother and what have you, and they lay, they lay their lives down on the line for people that they barely know. But there's just something when you're together with somebody for a while. And it's not even just, you know, being with them for a while, there's something different when you're abroad as well. Because you can live with somebody, have a roommate or a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, or whatever. But I'm always amazed when I meet couples that have been together for years, and I'll uh, talk to their wife or the husband, and I'll ask them what I would think to be very basic questions. And their significant other who's standing nearby would be would be like, Oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that about you. Or Oh, I never thought to ask you that. Like very, what I would think would be very simple questions. But when you're together traveling, I, I think part of the reason you also get to know somebody better as well is not only are you stuck in a box with somebody, um, I think you're also more your authentic self. 
because you don't have that you don't have that thing above your head of trying to act a certain way because you're back home in society. You're just more you. You don't have that stress. Your your mind isn't distracted where you're thinking about work or some problem. You're just like this naked version of yourself wherever you are for the world to see. Um, but when when you're traveling, whereas when you're back home, like yeah, there's just you're under the grind and under the gun and. It's just a different experience. So everybody is seeing each other with masks on, I guess, which is why you never get to know each other as well. But when you're traveling, you get to know somebody very, very intimately, um, which is why I think some relationships break up, right? Like somebody can be together with somebody for six months and they go on vacation for one week or they go on their honeymoon and they break up afterwards because they actually see their real version of the other person. (laughs) It's true. So let's talk a little bit about goals. So how many countries have you been to, Mark? As of now, I've been to 100 countries. Holy if you want fuck. to throw in, if you want to throw in uh, Palestine, it would be like a 100 and one. But I don't know. Most people don't count that as another country. People don't count yeah, like, Palestine as another country? Um, if you're looking at like the United Nations, yeah. it's, that's kind of the list I go by of what the official countries are. I mean, I, I, I came up with this goal. You're speaking of goals. I came up with this goal several years ago when I had really taken an interest in travel because I've, I've sort of always had an interest in travel and it goes way back to my childhood, uh, where I had an interest in world geography and I still do to this day. There was something about looking at an atlas that my parents had given me and looking at all these places because there were there were pictures in this atlas and I would see, oh, this is Amsterdam or this is Hong Kong. And you would read about these places and it put an interest in me, even as, as a young child, that I wanted to one day try to go see as many of these places as possible. And of course, you know, when you grow up, you are dealt with all sort of situations in life and you either don't have the time or you don't have the money and you try to work out your life uh, scenario to where you can use the money to go do what your passion is. And I got to that point and I first started traveling, um, I guess, with a different intent and I sort of referenced it at the very beginning of the podcast. I had a friend or I have a friend named Brian and and our interest in travel was more like we're going to go to these places, big cities that have a good nightlife scene for the, for the gay community. So once we sort of exhausted the U.S., it's like, where can we go? So we would go to Mexico City or Guadalajara or to Costa Rica or Brazil. We even went to Venezuela and uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, and what was developing was like, I, yeah, I was like having fun going out to the clubs and, and maybe meeting some some guys here or there. But what I was left more with was what we would do during the day when we would do some of the tourist things. And, and you know, you'd take your pictures. This was before there was any such thing as a, a smartphone or even a digital camera. Uh, we'd get back and, you know, you get your film developed and then you'd look at the pictures and be like, well, I'm more impressed with what I did during the day than what happened at night. And so the interest in travel was sort of developing. And then I guess when I first went to to Europe, uh, I think it was like 2001, um, right after 9-11, it was like a whole new world. I went to Italy. That was my first European country, and it's still one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, But then I continued traveling. And I think it was maybe, I don't know, when I was in China one time, I met a lady and she asked me if I was a member of the Century Club. And I don't know what the heck she was talking about. And she explained to me that there's this supposed club to where anyone that's been to 100 countries can become a member. And I didn't really care about being a member of the club, but I started to think, wow, can I one day actually go to see 100 countries? And uh, sure enough, this last November, uh, I went to Israel, and it was my 100th 100, 100th country. So um, I guess that was a goal that I I laid out for myself, and I I made it. So it was 
quite fun doing it too. <laughs> now, so when you when you book your trips, do you actually contemplate in your mind, um, is, or is it a consideration that you're trying to add to that that list of, to get to a hundred, or when you were trying to reach that list of a hundred, or do you just book a place based on where you feel like going, and then if it happens to add to that hundred, so be it. No, actually, I, I kept a spreadsheet and I oh, did you? laid out all these years, every year, and you know what I anticipated, the places that I would go, countries that I gave consideration to, to where there were options because there are certain countries that, you know, there's not a good time to go just yet, like maybe Syria, for instance. I mean, I went to Lebanon and I was in Damascus and I saw the sign that said, Syria, the border to Syria straight ahead. And I so wanted to go to Damascus, but like you can't. So Syria would not be on my list of countries to go visit. Um, so I do, I do sort of plan out, or I was planning out to go see countries that I've never seen before. Now, you know, there are a lot of places that I saw that I want to go back. Um, I want to see some countries more than what I have seen, you know, thus far. I mean, you know, there might have been a place that I was only there for like a night and I want to see more. So there are those countries like that. There's other countries that I feel like I've seen pretty much everything and I don't have a need to go back. And then there's places that I really, really enjoyed and I want to go back many times. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, it's just, it depends. Um, you know, this year might not work out. Uh, just because of what's going on with, with travel and the virus. And so, um, you know, I had planned on going to the Seychelles and the Madagascar, but I don't know if that's going to come to fruition or not. I do have a, a, a trip booked for next year to Japan. Strangely enough, I have not been to Japan. It's not one of the 100 countries. And if another country that I haven't been to in Europe uh, – is Germany. And I mean, most people would think, how can you go to 100 countries and not see Germany? Well, it's because I've been to Bosnia. I've been to Moldova. I've been to every other country just about in Europe. Yeah, but Germany's somehow, interesting because uh, when I went there yeah, a few I'm years ago, I actually had no interest in going to Germany. Um, probably part of it because, you know, the whole World War II thing and me not being white, I, I, I guess I have this ingrained perception that perhaps Germany is a bit of a a racist country. And I say that maybe that they're more nationalistic than anything. Cause when I was doing my undergrad, I had a group of uh, my friends that did their year abroad in Germany. And even my friends that were white with blonde hair and blue eyes, even they were kind of like given the stink eye and told off by older people there telling them to go back home. So I was like, fuck, I wonder what they tell me if I went there. Right. So what, but what was interesting is when I went to, I did a tour of uh, Europe a few years ago and I went to, I think eight or nine countries Believe it or not, Germany, shockingly to me, ended up being, I think, my favorite country, which really surprised the hell out of me because I didn't even care to go there. Um, and, was, you know, of course, that's why it's good to travel because you dispel all these myths in your head about how places are because, I mean, it totally wasn't, you know, racist. People were super nice, super friendly. I really enjoyed my time there. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I just haven't been. It's, it's been one of those things where... uh like if I was to do a tour of Europe, which um, I have done tours of Europe, I think it's much, it's very easy to go to Europe on your own and do your own thing. Um, I just never crossed into Germany for some reason. All or all around, obviously. I've even been to Ukraine, Belarus. I also have not been to Russia. So, mm -hmm. um, but there's places that I have been, um, and my favorite, my favorite city in the world. I know that you were probably wondering what that might be <laughs> it is istanbul turkey i i love that city there's something about the contrast of east and west rich and poor uh worldly and secular that gives such a pull on your senses um there's a lot of unique things to see there that you really don't see anywhere else they they have uh the whirling dervishes that they're favorite they're famous for um, obviously the Blue Mosque in Hagia Sophia, uh, the underground cistern, top copy palace. I really say that if anybody hasn't been to Istanbul to go give it a try because there's so much to see and there's so much to do that's 
pretty unique. I mean, you won't find the same things to see and do in a lot of places. Plus, you're in a nice city. You have the comforts of nice hotels, great restaurants, great shopping. It's, you know, I, I don't know if they how they consider the most uh, populated cities in Europe, but I would say that uh, it probably is the most populated city in, in Europe. So, well, let's, uh, let's let's shift gears and start talking about the fun stuff so we can get some ratings on the show. Um, one of them being, you know, since you're talking about Turkey, why don't you tell us, uh, and I'll sh- probably, I'll try to share one of my interesting stories, legal ones anyway. Um, why don't you tell us about one of the interesting, or one of the, how about this? What's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to you when you're traveling? Because you brought up Turkey and I, I remember you telling me about your brush with death. And I, I think that was Turkey, if I'm not mistaken, was it? Yeah, I've, I've had a couple of brushes with what I, what I consider it was like a near, it could have been a death experience. Um, the first time I was in Istanbul, I went to the hammam to, or to the bathhouse. And so what exactly is was, a bathhouse just for those of people listening that isn't, aren't sure what that is. Um, it, you know, the, the old ways of doing a bath, I mean, it's the, sort of like the Roman way. And, uh, it, it's this big, uh, this complex, that's sort of like dome shaped. And they have a hole in the ceiling so that the steam that's there inside can escape. But there are these marble uh, slats and platforms that people lay on, and they sweat profusely. So you get all of your impurities out of your body. And then I don't know how it is in, in the women's section, but in the men's section, you know, you've been laying there for like 30, 40 minutes, and then some big, burly, hairy Turkish guy comes up and starts to bathe you. I mean, literally, they have the soap and the water, and they are scrubbing every part of your body. And when you're finally done and rinsed off and and relaxed and then leave the facility, you've felt like you've never been cleaner before in your entire life. So the first time that I was uh, in Istanbul, I went to this hammam or, or a bathhouse. They call it hammam in Turkish. Um, I had a, an amazing experience. And so the second time I went back, I had to actually go find that same hammam and go back to. And I did. And I had rested, sweated out. And then I saw the guy and he had his big bucket of soapy water. And I mean, the soap is about, I don't know, two feet high in the bucket. So there's like, it's just you're just going to be drenched with soap. And so when he approached me, um, I somehow I took a huge, deep breath, but he had already started to pour the soap on me, and all of this soap got into my lungs, and I couldn't breathe. I was literally drowning in soap. And my first instinct is to stand up and to try to get out of there to get some air because it's it's very steamy it's very humid you can you're already breathing deeply well i'm breathing deeply and i'm just getting soaked and i immediately fall to the floor because my whole body is slippery and it's on marble so i mean it's a wonder i didn't crack my tailbone or hit my head and the man was freaking out because i'm just like gasping for air gasping for air And he's trying to give me water. Well, I can't drink because I can't get anything down me. And uh, eventually, I calmed down. I guess the soap disintegrated in my body and inside of my body. And I was able to drink some water. But I tell you, my throat burned for the next two days because of that. But I was very fortunate that something bad didn't happen. Um, Well, so, Mark, let let me ask you, since the audience may be wondering, and it's a really important question... Did you die? <laughs> yes, I did. And now I'm back to haunt you for the rest of your life. Fuck! <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then as far as another experience of uh, maybe a near death, uh, happened many years prior. I think it was 1996 in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And if your listeners probably hear me say Rio, they know yeah. they know where I'm. They know where I'm going with. I almost because... got killed a few times in Rio, so I'll probably share some stories after yours. But yeah, yeah. You're, you expect to die yeah. if you go to Rio. 
as much as beautiful yeah, as the I mean, city is. Yeah, I mean, it, Rio is one of the most be- naturally beautiful cities in the entire world. Um, well, I remember when I went there it, in 2006, I went there, I spent a summer there as part of a law school program. And uh, I remember at that point, it was actually considered the most dangerous city in the world, more so than any, even any city in Afghanistan. And this is when the Afghan, the US Afghanistan war was going on. So yeah, it's a pretty gnarly place, but sorry to interrupt you, carry on. Oh, no, no, that's okay. Uh, um, yeah. My, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of petty crimes happen during the day. I even had a friend that was there laying out at the beach and someone just comes up and just yanks his gold necklace off mm-hmm. of his neck, uh, which, you know, I knew about that sort of stuff and I would never even take anything of value to the beach. But we were, my friend and I, we were, this was back when we were going to the club to like, you know, have fun. And uh, we were leaving the club and it was strange because while we were there, I had met this guy from Spain that I had previously met in Dallas. So it's like someone I felt like I knew and he was there in a uh, real on business. And the three of us decided we were going to share a taxi and go back to the hotel. Well, we got into the taxi and he said, you know, this taxi is going to take us the opposite direction of the hotel because it's a one way street and we're going to end up paying more if we go this way. So why don't we walk down the side street and catch the other one way street and we'll be on our way. And, uh, mistake because you don't walk down the side street at night at three o'clock in the morning in Rio. And, um, we did, uh, he, my, I got mugged. My friend got mugged. The guy from Spain did not get mugged. I don't know why to this day. I wonder if he was in on it or if they felt like he was a local and they, um, uh, weren't going to do anything to him because maybe they could be identified later on by him, but nevertheless, um, they, they ripped my watch off of my wrist and it cut my wrist when they were like yanking it off. Uh, they had a hard time getting my wallet out of my pants. And so, uh, they were like this big guy. He was like about six foot two long, curly black hair. He and I began to wrestle. Why? I don't know. Maybe I was intoxicated and thought I can take him on. And so we're on the road, on the street, like rolling around in circles. And I'm trying to like fight. And then I look up and there's about eight guys surrounding us. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I must be out of my mind. Why do I think that I'm going to fight this guy off? I look up, my friend Brian that I was with, his whole pants pocket was ripped down to the back of his knee where they had like ripped his wallet out and torn his pants up. And I just like stand there and I'm like, okay, with my arms up, I'm like, take it. So they got my wallet out and then they once again, kick me, kick my legs out from under me and I fall back down to the ground. But for one, I was, I was foolish. I was, I was cut up, uh, I guess from the wrestling and stuff. And, uh, we walked down to the end of the street after they'd all run off and they got our, our goods. And wouldn't you know, there's a, a, a police, uh, off police department right there on the corner uh we go in they said there's nothing they they can do oh i mean like, well, half the time they're in on it so yeah they're not going to do shit well, for yeah so it's like, well can you can you get us a taxi so <laughs> yeah we got we got a taxi that's all we got oh man well i had so, many similar story yeah i had a similar incident and this isn't broad forget a side street you i mean i'm sure the place has changed now maybe it hasn't i don't know but my story wasn't even on a side street at night. It was in broad daylight in the middle of the Copa Cabana. And uh, when we had just been walking, me and a couple of friends, and we're walking on the Copa Cabana, and we had stopped at one of those many kind of shacks or huts along the Copa, Copa Cabana boardwalk and beach where you can just sit down and order some juice or whatever. And we had done that. And of course, you know, the two guys I were with, these two white guys from Florida, super nice guys. And, you know, I guess one of them smoked weed and of course them being the sticking out kind of american guys people would people approached us about uh you know do you want like drugs and i think it was if i'm not mistaken just like weed or something like that and you know the last thing i ever want to get involved with in a foreign country is well i don't do drugs anyway but 
last thing you would ever anybody would ever want to mess around with is drugs in a foreign country because if you ever watched like tv shows like locked up abroad or whatever unlike some countries like maybe european countries or north american countries a lot of countries as liberal as they look on the surface with the their sex industries and what have you drugs are a whole different matter thailand being a great example or singapore especially thailand where yeah i mean you can buy whatever you want there and it's like a free-for-all but if it's like drugs i mean you're getting the death penalty so you never want to mess with drugs in a foreign country um but so some guy had approached one of the guys i was with about buying some i think weed and this is broad daylight and of course my friend was kind of half interested because you know you're on an adventure and me and the other guy were like eh, i don't know i don't this doesn't feel good because we don't want to fuck something up and get in trouble and be, you know next thing you know we're making headlines so one of them's like no it's okay i'll wait for the guy because this guy's like okay i'll get you something and i'll come back just wait here and to me that's even more suspicious right so we're waiting around for a while um i don't really want to have anything to do with it my other friend's kind of getting nervous about it more and more time's passing and the guy comes back he's like no i'll be back like i'm just waiting for something you guys stick here you guys stick around here and after a while me and the other guy um i'll just call him jack uh just to protect names we decide you know let's just leave let's get out of here so me and jack decide to get going so we start walking along we're like fuck this we start walking along the copacabana back to our hotel whereas the our other friend decided to stick around because we're like you know we don't want to risk anything so we're walking back next thing you know there's while we're walking back there's this little friggin 10 8 9 10 year old kid um he starts like following me and me and my friend jack and but he's like he's targeting me more and he's like he's trying to talk to me i'm just ignoring him he's speaking portuguese i, I don't speak portuguese fluently but i understand it and he's uh next thing you know he starts like trying to reach into my my pocket in my shorts and when i look back to see him doing that i also see there's not just this one little eight or nine year old there's now like eight or nine other fucking kids with him in his little group following us and this asshole starts um reaching into my pocket he's like G- give me what you got and i'm like who the fuck's this little runt and all of a sudden he's like he but the whole time he had one of his hands behind his back and so he starts saying in portuguese he's like i have a gun i have a gun i'm like oh fuck and so i didn't believe that he had a gun to be honest with you and again this isn't broad daylight it must have been freaking 4 p.m and it's a crowded place that's the shitty thing it's a crowded place right but the crime then was so rampant these guys didn't give a fuck about doing it in broad daylight and so he's like he's trying to reach in my pockets and i had nothing in my pockets anyway but he's like i have a gun i have a gun now i didn't believe he had a gun but i thought he at least had a blade a a knife so i i kind of pushed him back and i turned back and i didn't want to run because i didn't want to exacerbate the situation but i i I kind of turned back to keep going forward expecting he was at least going to slap like you know cut me open in the back and um my friend zach stops and there's this weird standoff where this other kid that was standing on a beach and this is some big this is a big motherfucker He, he looked young but he was one of these giant guys this giant gets up from a bench one of these concrete benches and he looks at us and so you have this face off between me jack and this group of now like nine or ten kids and this giant and it's one of these incidents where shit's either gonna get really really bad right now where we're gonna get swarmed and have our fucking heads kicked in or everybody's just gonna go their separate way and so for the, there's a standoff for about five seconds where it's like they're trying to make a decision whether they should pursue this further and we're just kind of looking at them and then Zach kind of, or Jack kind of makes a, a funny head movement and like it's like let's just let this thing go and we both me and Jack keep walking and they just kind of look at each other and they just say fuck it and they decide to you know go back to their part of the Copacabana but yeah that was one of the many I'd hate I'd love to say in my summer there that was the only thing that happened that was just that day I didn't even get to what happened in the night or the next night or the next night. So, yeah, Rio is a fucking interesting animal. But I know when they had the Olympics there uh, a few year, several years ago, one of the big concerns is uh, by the, the Olympic Committee and all the countries for that matter is, you know, Rio, you better fucking clean your act up before the Olympics comes to town. Because, you know, the favelas and everything are their own entity, right? Like, and they come down yeah. from the mountain and 
they do their own shit. Like if you've ever seen the movie from you know twenty years ago, did you ever watch the movie City of God? I think it won an Academy. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did that, that. that there's really nothing that's scripted about that movie. Frankly, I mean that's just real life. Well, I mean I'm sure the movie is scripted, but that's actually real life. There wasn't you didn't need to dramatize anything because if I, I'll tell you more stories about people. I had friends get picked up by the cops where the cops basically kept them in the cop car and literally had them drive, drive from ATM to ATM machine. Um, so they could just strain their bank accounts from back home. But yeah, Br- Brazil's an interesting animal. Yeah. Brazil and, and several places on the planet are, are unique experiences, but I wouldn't let any of these stories that we just shared deter anybody from wanting to venture out and, and go see these places. Just, Take an element of precaution with you and you'll be just fine. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to me, it's that adventure that's the exciting part of traveling. You know, there are are different types of trips. There's what I call a vacation where you go to an all-inclusive in Cancun and do nothing. And then there's a trip. And I try to go on trips sometimes where, you know, you kind of want some action to happen. And so, you know, for example, I went to North Korea last year and everybody's like, oh my God, you're crazy. This could happen. That could happen. I'm like, well, yeah, I could have, but that's part of the fun. So, you know, you got to have some excitement in your life. And yeah, these, like, like we said earlier during our Brazil discussion, Brazil actually, in my opinion, is the most beautiful, aesthetically beautiful country I've ever seen, especially Rio. Um, so don't let these things stop you from going. So with that, uh, why don't we change gears for a moment and let's talk about excitement since we're, you know, I'm mentioning it here. And so, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the most exciting thing you've done on a trip is? Now, exciting things can happen to us, or we can get get them or get into them proactively, whether it's sexual or gastronomically speaking, uh, because you know a trip is a way to let loose. And so, tell us a little bit about first of all what country you were in and what that exciting thing was. Okay, sure. Um... For me, I'm not really much of an adventure seeker, but this one thing that I really wanted to do, I was on a tour with Gate One, and I ended up in the country of Zimbabwe in Africa, right at Victoria Falls. Excellent. Okay. I've heard a lot about Victoria Falls. I know it's increasing as a, a tourist destination. So why did you go to Africa in the first place? Oh, well, I mean, Africa is sort of like that place that um, you want to go, you want to see nature, you want to see animals, you want to be outside of your comfort zone. Even when you go to Europe and uh, Australia, even parts of Asia, uh, it's it's very organized, it's very easy. In Africa, it, it puts you sort of out, of out of your element and opens up, you know, a wide array of possibilities. And the one thing that I wanted to do there was uh, cross Victoria, cross the Zambezi River, go into Zambia, and take a micro light flight over the falls. Okay, very cool. So I'm familiar with what a micro light flight is now because you've talked to me about it in the past. But tell us what turned you on to doing a micro light flight, and more importantly, for those of our listeners that don't know what it is, what the hell is a micro light flight? <laughs> Oh, uh, what turned me on to doing this was I saw a friend post on Facebook several years prior that she had done this when she was uh, in the same countries. And it's someone that I admire quite a bit. She's traveled even more uh, frequently and broadly than I have. And so I knew that I wanted, when I went to these countries, I wanted to, to do the exact same thing. And what it is, is it's like you're in a go-kart flying in the air and with these big uh, wings and fortunately attached to the wing is a a camera and they take pictures or videos of you that you pay for in advance so that being said you're about a mile off the ground and you're seeing elephants below you're seeing the the river the falls it's quite an experience okay so uh, tell us a bit more so first of all just so people can gauge how it works how much does something like that cost? Um, I think it was around a $150. And you think about it, $150 to spend for a once-in-a-lifetime experience, I think it's well worth it. 
Uh, the thing is, you have to leave everything behind. I mean, I left my my wallet, my uh, passport, everything that was of any kind of personal value to me was left behind because you couldn't as much take as a piece of tissue in your pocket when you were on the flight because the propeller is behind you. And if anything was, you know, were to blow out, it's going to blow right into the propeller. So you had to, you had nothing with you. So if you crashed, nobody would really know if people back in the office that, and their, your money would be theirs. <laughs> Well, and I imagine weight is also a major factor. So what we'll do for their, the audience is after I post this podcast, I'm going to post some of the pictures uh, with your permission, of course, Dali, of your flight, because those are some of the most spectacular photos I've ever seen. And it'll for those of you that are still trying to struggle with what the hell's a microlight flight, if you don't feel like Googling it, we'll show some pictures of uh, Mark actually doing it. And so you're up in the air, just you and one other guy and what looks like a motorized hang glider in essence, right? Correct. And, and the, the pilot that I had was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, you get off the ground and, and your, your body is telling you, you shouldn't be doing this, that you're going to fall out, that gravity is going to take over. But this guy, he was from, he was of German descent and he was, had the most calming voice. He put me at ease, put me at rest and even got me so comfortable that, Midway through the flight, he let me take the reins and, and guide the flight myself, which I was just overwhelmed in doing something like that. And so do you recall how high up you were at the at the height of your, your flight? We were about a mile, a mile or so, mile and a quarter off the ground. So that that's a perfect segue, uh, since you mentioned a German guy and you were a mile in the sky. Did you join the Mile High Club? At that point, no, unfortunately, I did not. Did you want to? Not in that contraption, no. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> really just in my life in that thing, no. Okay. Maybe fine. when I got back to the ground, I I felt like giving him a big kiss for getting me back safely. Well, of course, <laughs> on the lips, on anything. Really, <laughs> damn man, those Germans. Uh, okay, well, fascinating. So, yeah, I remember seeing your photographs, and like I said, I'll post them. But yeah, that looked amazing, frankly. I know you, I use that word a lot, but that that definitely looked exciting. I mean, I thought some of my various zip linings were exciting, and some were because they jerry rigged cables to rocks and shit like that. But yeah, yeah, that thing looked really amazing. I would totally have to do that. And for those of you out there that you know shun doing the occasional side tour when you're on a, a trip somewhere. Because maybe you think it costs a little bit more than you plan to spend. These trips are all about spending more than you plan to spend. Because, like, when else are you going to get a chance to do certain things? And, you know, if something costs a few bucks, who cares? Like, money is one of the most replaceable things you can ever replace in the world, frankly, right? Like, I may not be able to build a toaster oven or repair a car engine, but I can make money. And so can you. Uh, so don't worry about it. Because you're really just buying experiences and you're buying... Uh, education, because there's really no greater education than travel and these experiences you go on. So thanks for sharing that story with us about that excitement. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about exciting things that have happened on our trips because, well, we want you to tune in and it's fun talking about them, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And we mentioned at the very beginning uh, about goals and and even this example of the micro lot thought, it was a goal for me after I saw my friend post it and do it. I was so interested in doing it. So the fact that I uh, followed through with this dream and I, I made this goal a reality, uh, I think that that's part of, you know, living life of, of even travel, everything that we've been discussing today thus far. Well, you know, we're at 48 minutes or almost an hour. So I'm going to wrap the show up today. Uh, I know we didn't get to talk about a lot of stuff we wanted to talk about. So we're going to do something we've never done before. So today will be a unique day. Not only did we have our first guest slash co-host, but we're going to end up doing another couple episodes uh, as Mark and I chat about the different things we've done on our trips. And all of this isn't really to boast or brag. These are just things that are part of our normal life. But we really hope, and I hope I speak for you, Dali, is that uh, we hope that this inspires even one person out there listening to maybe go buy that flight somewhere, maybe go buy that 
that tour and step out of your comfort zone and try something new. Because once you start doing this stuff, there's really no going back. Unless you're just straight up not cut out for traveling. And that's totally cool too. Uh, but for those of you that have been dreaming about it for a long time, it's not as hard as you think it is once you get going. Um, you just have to jump into the deep end of the pool. And I'm not saying make your first trip to North Korea or an active war zone in Syria, which, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> something I'm thinking of doing <laughs> soon. I, I don't know why, but anyways, that may be my next thing. But I'm not saying you have to go balls to the wall like that. Start off small. Uh, even if you want to go to, I don't know, a red state. <laughs> in the United States, <laughs> or if you just want to go to Mexico or something like that. And, and you know what? Like, with all due respect to the uh, Department of Homeland Security or the State Department, rather, yeah, there, there are a lot of things up there in the United States saying, oh, don't go to this country, don't go to that country. Like, I remember for the last decade, they were like, the State Department's like, don't go to Mexico. And I'm like, I go to Mexico and the place is totally fine. So don't get, don't look for reasons to be deterred from taking the plunge on a trip. Look for reasons why you should go and try to ignore a lot of the outside noise. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Dali. I don't know. I just, I totally concur. I mean, you, you live this life, you develop dreams, you develop goals, uh, in, in any facet and you shouldn't let a element of fear creep in if it's something that you really want to do. And if you can do it in the right mind, the right place, uh, I'd say go for it. And so I'll, I'll leave you with this little story I had, uh, or I have, <laughs> I, I, I haven't told this one to you, Mark, so bear with me. Um, so I was at the AVN Awards a few years ago. For those of you that don't know what that is, those are the, that's the big porn convention in Vegas every year. And I was with one of my friends and I guess he knew this kind of weird guy that worked at Ralph's. And that guy joined us uh, that evening. We were all, you know, he had had a big, he had a big suite at one of the hotels, I think at the Hard Rock. And, you know, he, the tons of people there. And so one of these kind of weird friends that he knew that joined us in Las Vegas, I remember his name, his name was Richard, but they called him something more der derogatory, which I'm not going to repeat here. And I, I'm not sure why he put up with it. Uh, but nonetheless, he was fascinated by the fact that my friend and myself had ever left the country. Uh, and I, you know, I got to talking with him that night cause I thought it was kind of, a, he was an interesting character anyway. And I was like, well, what are you so afraid about going somewhere? He's like, well, I just don't understand. Like, how do you do it? I'm like, well, we buy a plane ticket and we go to the country that we want to go to like Thailand. And we got to talking about Thailand. He's like, yeah, but how do you buy stuff? I'm like, well, you buy stuff with money. He's like, but they take American money there? And I'm like, well, they can, but you can buy it with their own money. He's like, but I don't understand. Where do you, where do you get the money from? Because if I put my wow. ATM card in the ATM machine in Thailand, won't American money come out? And I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> this poor guy, man. He couldn't even, even get over the mental hurdle of how do you pay for things in a foreign country? And I thought, a guy like that, maybe he shouldn't travel, at least not to a foreign country, because he would just get taken to the cleaners, get ripped off. Because if you don't even know that you can take out money in a local currency in a foreign country, I mean, yeah, maybe he should just stay in Las Vegas working at Ralph's. But that's why I say jump in, maybe into the kiddie pool first, go to another state, then maybe go to Mexico. <laughs> so if, if, if shit hits the fan, you can you know quickly come home instead of being stranded. So I thought that was a funny story because I was like, I couldn't believe the misconceptions this poor guy had. You know, if, even he could go with a friend that would maybe hold his hand and teach him the, the way things go. I mean, you're not going to know everything when you travel. I mean, I remember the first time I, I rode a train in, in Europe. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but you figure it out. And, you know. I think that maybe someone could help him and even he could go and, and travel if, if he, if he so desired. For sure. You can figure it out. And uh, yeah, like Mark said, a great idea. Go with somebody that's experienced. The only rub to that is seasoned travelers. At least maybe I just speak for myself, but seasoned travelers usually you don't want to travel with like complete novices because they just become a, well, you don't enjoy your trip as much, but he could always go with somebody for sure. And Hey, set aside a set aside a ripoff budget. What's a ripoff budget? 
just expect that you're going to lose money getting ripped off on taxi fares, mm -hmm. restaurants. But that's part of the learning experience. And, you know, those are things we'll talk about in the next show. Experiences that we had where, where we've been ripped off. I'm sure you have, Mark. Um, oh, yeah. I have a little bit. Oh, well, you already talked about when you got jacked in Brazil. So, uh, so we'll talk about that. But that's it for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Dally, thanks for joining us from Dallas. I appreciate your time. And uh, how did you enjoy the show today? Oh, it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I mean, yeah, let's do this again. Let's do it. So everybody, don't forget to subscribe and leave five stars. That way you'll get notified, whether you're using iTunes or Google Podcasts or whatever, or Spotify, you'll get notified of the latest episodes as they come out. And if you have any questions, hey, just shoot us an email or, you know, leave a message for us and we'll ha be happy to answer any of your questions. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next show. Thanks again for tuning in to The Everglow, chronicling my life as an empath as I travel the globe. Check us out on Instagram at N-E-I-L-B-H-A-R-T-I-A -I -I for more photos related to this and other podcasts.